welcome. I'd like to welcome you to, to another Washington County Public Affairs Forum. With a few brief announcements for the forum, I'd like to remind you that our Board of Directors meetings occur at the first Monday of the month after our regular meeting here. That is germane because the board is discussing a few changes and uh, uh, two points to those changes is that uh, we'd like to include you as the members on our discussions to reduce the number of board members to better match the ratio of board members to the, the constituents we have here. And that's also my less than gentle segue to the ask if you'd like to serve on our board of directors, please see me and please visit our board meetings. They're open to uh, everyone, our members and the public at large. Uh, I'd like to uh, let you know that here for the forum, we reach people in many different ways. In addition to this meeting here, we also reach people through Tualatin Valley Cable Television. On top of that, we also run a YouTube channel. So if you search for Washington County Forum or Washington County Public Affairs Forum, you'll find us on the internet. We're also streaming uh, occasional meetings live and that will be embedded on our Washington County Forum uh, website. We also have a Facebook page, a Facebook group, and we also do something kind of interesting, which is if you have an eye thingy, like an iPhone, an iPad, we have this web URL where you can download the audio of our meetings, and that's washingtoncounty.podomatic.com. So this is where you can take the meetings with you and listen to them at your pleasure. What I'd like to do is now start uh, the introduction of Mr. Tom Marsh. He has this book, and this book is available for sale for $29.99 from OSU Press, uh, To the Promised Land by Tom Marsh. He is really helping me deliver what I think you guys want. We have political season right around the corner. Next week, we have Andy Dyke, Alan Amabiska, and the political junkies want their red meat. I know you do. I hear your stomachs rumbling. You want the red meat of politics. Um, and so this is a, a wonderful, gentle way that we can uh, ramp into political season with a good history of politics as uh, spoken by Tom Marsh. What I'd like you to do now is please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Tom Marsh. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's wonderful being back in Washington County. We lived here for 30 years in uh, Cedar Hills, and I taught at Sunset High School for 22. Jim Cape over here was one of my students, uh, and he's middle-aged now, um, <laughs> so it was a while back. Uh, Jim has an enviable record, and that is that he never misses one of my public engagements. He's been to every one of my talks in the area. I've spoken twice at the Beaverton Library, and Jim has been there both times as well as today. And Jim, I appreciate your support. Really, I do. Um, I ran for the legislature in 1974 as a father of two young daughters, wife over here and two young daughters. And um, it was in the wake of Watergate. And um, I was an absolute novice. I had never run for public office before, uh, but felt I wanted to do that. I'd always been a political junkie since I was 12 years old and wrote the, in the 1952 convention returns on from the black and white television set. I had a, a big piece of plywood that I had painted black and I had all the states listed and as the returns came in on the floor of the Democratic convention, this is Adley Stevenson we're talking about, <laughs> I'm uh, writing at 12 years old, I'm writing the numbers up on the board. So my mother was a very active de Democrat and I th think I got that from her uh, being a Democrat and being active. At any rate, I ran in 1974, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a grassroots campaign involved lots of students, lots of parents, lots of neighborhood coffees, homemade lawn signs. Spent very little money, but we had lots of people working, and I was elected by 565 votes against Marva Graham, who uh, had moved to the district recently, had been appointed the director of the sta state health department by Governor Tom McCall. Her husband, Doug Graham, was a doctor and also a legislator. So she was a very formidable, progressive, middle-of-the-road Republican candidate. Unfortunately, uh, virtually all of my team of, of um, my, my support team, my campaign workers, my treasurer, and uh, my uh, volunteer coordinator, and of course uh, the campaign chairman, uh, were all women, and uh, most of them Republicans, and they were working for me. So it, it really did help, but at any rate, uh, 
lo and behold, I was elected, ran for re-election in 1976 and uh, was re-elected two to one, went to the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, that, that was my interlude uh, from teaching full time. Uh, I came back to Re Sunset High School where I taught from 1968 to 1990 and uh, came back and was fortunate enough uh, when Jim Hager was here as superintendent to uh, get him to uh, convince him that it was time to establish some optional high schools. So we established the uh, community high school, which still exists, and the Arts and Communication Magnet Academy, which is going gangbusters over in the old C.E. Mason site. Um, I was one of the founders of that program as well. I left teaching in 1996 to retire to Salem with my wife where we built a house and we've lived there for 15 years uh, out in the quiet country off of Butner Road, no longer by Sunset Highway where we lived for 30 years with all that noise and all that traffic. We don't miss that at all. <laughs> anyway, I'm delighted to be here today. I, I, I used to come to some forum meetings way back so long ago I can't even remember. It was got to be 35, 40 years, however long you've been around. At any rate, um, it's fun to be back and I'm delighted to talk to you today. When um, John McWilliams called me and asked me uh, to consider coming up today, he had, um, he threw some ideas out uh, because of course I can talk about a uh, hundred topics, it's whatever you want. Uh, my book uh, is the first of its type, uh, the only one of its type, um, and the reason I wrote it is because nobody had. It's that simple. As a teacher, I wanted to teach something about state history, political history, government and politics in the Oregon, and I never could find material. So um, I started digging and doing research, and when I took a sabbatical in 1990-91, uh, I started out researching the background for this book. It took me 21 years to finish it, um, and uh, but I finally got it done, and it was published uh, in May uh, of uh, 2012 by the Oregon State University Press, an academic press, so I'm pleased for that. Um, this is, uh, as Eric was mentioning, as he was making his introductory re remarks, uh, political junkies will love this book. If your son or daughter are remotely interested, you've got a grandson who's a an budding attorney, uh, or you've got a brother or a brother-in-law who just loves junk about Oregon history, this is a book you want to get them because uh, everything in here that you can imagine is here from the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, which in fact took over the Oregon House of Representatives. In 1923, the Klan had taken over the House and put Casper K. Kubli, K, 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 number one card-holding member in the state of Oregon, and the Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives in 1923 was the card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan. That was an interesting year, but I'm not talking about that today. But I'm giving it to you as a sample of the kind of thing you'll, f you'll find in the book. Uh, history to me is about um, the actions of human beings and the consequences of those actions. It's just that simple. History is no more complicated than that, really, uh, at least when you're talking about the history of human beings their institutions, their societies, their cultures, their beliefs, their values, and the history that they make. Today we're going to talk about three elections, uh, and I, first of all, want to preface my remarks by telling you that no way in 35 or 40 minutes can I begin to scratch the surface of three elections. That's one reason I've given you the handout, so that you'll have some familiarity with at least the personalities that we're talking about and putting them in some kind of a context in terms of their time frame. Uh, I will be talking about the campaigns themselves. Uh, John suggested that that would be a good topic because uh, you are starting uh, looking at the, uh, to look at the May primary and uh, apparently are going to have a number of speakers who are gonna be in that vein. So here I am to talk to you about three elections. Uh, I can see a lot of you in this room are my age or older which means you're going to remember the 1968 campaign. If you were in Oregon, you certainly will remember that one. You probably won't remember the 1954 campaign, unless you're well into your 80s, and I think a couple of you are. But at any rate, 1954 is a long way back, but I'm, of course, going to start 100 years ago with 1910. This campaign in involves Oswald West and Jay Bowerman. 
Jay Bowerman, the father of Bill Bowerman, William Bowerman, longtime track coach at the University of Oregon, Olympic coach, et cetera, one of the co-founders with Phil Knight of Nike. His father was Jay Bowerman, who was acting governor of Oregon in 1910. Jay Bowerman was the Republican nominee for governor in 1910 against Oswald West. You can read about West on, the, on your green page. Uh, I am going to read some excerpts from my book so you can get a flavor of the kind of thing you're going to find in this book. Early one morning in late July 1910, Oswald West returned to his Portland hotel room on Washington Street. He had paid a late night visit to the Selwood home of Harry Lane, former Portland mayor. He had tried to persuade Lane to be the Democratic candidate for governor and left the doctor's home with the understanding that Lane would call him with the within the hour with an answer. The, the weary West nervously waited for Lane's call. Quote, I ate a banana and crawled into bed, lay awake hoping for a call from Dr. Lane, but none came. I again surveyed the field for a suitable candidate. As the time neared 2 a.m., I decided to become a candidate myself. So I arose, dumped the remaining bananas out of the bag, split it down the sides, flattened it out, and rode a gubernatorial platform. Crawled back into bed, cried, and fell asleep. In the morning, I caught an early train for Salem, borrowed the required filing fee from my fellow railroad commissioner, Tom Campbell, and thus became the Democratic candidate for governor, and strange as it may seem, was elected. Oswald West. A bruising contest between Oz West and Republican Jay Bowerman followed. The men were two of the rising stars in Oregon politics. Now let's talk about politics here in Oregon for a little while. Oregon in 1910 was at the end of a decade of political turmoil. Oregon had in 1902 adopted the initiative and the, re uh, the referendum, excuse me. The initiative and referendum had been adopted in 1902 by the male voters of Oregon. Remember, women are not in the equation. Women do not vote in federal or state elections in Oregon, or, nor anywhere in 1902 or 1910, for that matter. 1910, then, was uh, coming at the end of a period of, of incredible change in Oregon. Oregon was among the leaders, along with Wisconsin and Maine, in terms of political reform. So the initiative and the referendum are adopted in 1902. In 1904, voters in the state adopted the direct primary law. They said, we want to get away from the political party conventions, the state conventions, controlled by a relatively small number of men who then go out into the back room, and we know the stereotypes, in a smoke-filled room in the middle of the night, choose who the leaders of the state are going to be, not the people. Um, Mr. West certainly was an opponent of that kind of thinking. He was a supporter of the initiative and referendum and the direct primary. In 1906, Oregon held its first statewide primary. In 1906, the first state to do it. In 1908, we adopted the recall. In 1907, a man named Jonathan Bourne, who's a separate topic and a delicious subject for a speech, a talk, Jonathan Bourne, who had been one of the more corrupt politicians in Oregon in the 19th century, you can come down to uh, McMinniman's at 6.30 on the 29th of April in Wilsonville if you want, because I'm going, my talk there is going to be a political corruption in 19th century Oregon. Jonathan Bourne will be one of the people I talked about. Jonathan Maborn will be the first person elected Senate by the, to the U.S. Senate by the Oregon legislature based upon the will of the voters. Oregon had adopted what was called the Statement One Pledge. And this is all part of William Uren's reform movement started in the uh, middle 1890s, which led to the initiative referendum and recall but the statement one pledge simply was this. If you are going to run for public office in Oregon, for the legislature, excuse me, you must agree to take this pledge. If you do, 
then the people's choice candidate, whoever the voters choose as they, well, who they'd like to see as the nominee for U.S. Senate, they are bound to that pledge. Republican Party's doing that now with taxes, as you know, the National Party with its candidates to Congress. Well, we did it in Oregon. Uh, 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 Mr. Gear, Gear, Theodore Gear, who was governor of Oregon until 1903, Governor Gear had been chosen by the voters of the state as their nominee. They wanted him, they wanted the legislature to approve Governor Gear as the U.S. Senator. The legislature said, no way. They ignored him. Well, you can imagine how angry that made the hornets. The reformers were really angry that the legislature had simply ignored the commitment to the state with one pledge, had ignored Will Gear, and so what, what we have here is then the nest is brewing in six and seven and eight and nine and ten as the voters of the state are increasingly agitated with the, with the way that politics had been done. And Jay Barwin was part of that old way. He's running for governor. He's only 33 years old, but he is one of the bright lights in the Republican Party in 1900 and 1910, excuse me. All right, continuing with West. Um, both campaigned nonstop. To West, every town, no matter how small or remote, was an important destination. He trudged into fields, barbershops, banks, mining, and lumber camps to talk to voters. No man ever worked harder to get elected. Wherever there was a solitary voter, Oz West tried to reach him. He was in constant motion. The stakes were high in 1910. Bowerman opposed the statement one pledge and rested his campaign on that issue. Recall that until 1913, legislatures elected senators. And that's, of course, in Oregon where most of the, was the main source, one of the two main sources of political corruption. Who was going to be the U.S. Senator? Well, all you had to do is line up majority votes in the House and the Senate, and you could be the Oregon House and Senate, and you could become the next U.S. Senator. Well, you can imagine how much money flowed into, well, as late as the 1896, a, a Democrat could get $3,000 for a vote for Senate. There weren't very many Democrats. You could count them on my hand, but the Republicans would get $4,000 for a vote for the Senate in Oregon, in the legislature in the late 1890s. That's how the, the machine worked. That's the politics of it. So you can imagine how much money flowed in and out of campaigns. It was extraordinary, but no different than any other state. Oregon was not unique. This is the way politics is practiced. Okie dokie, we forget this. That's one reason I write a book, is because nobody knows this stuff, because we never taught it in school. Okay, um, Bowerman had been nominated by an assembly, a state assembly. He called it an assembly, it had been a convention, but he'd been nominated the old-fashioned way, Re and in, in refute of the primary law, open primary law. Oregon is three to one Republican. Oregon in 1902 elected a Democrat, George Chamberlain as governor. In 1886, they had elected a Democrat, Sylvester Penoyer, and Penoyer, and re-elected him in 1890. This is a state that's three to one Republican. Here we're getting Democrats elected. Well, that's another story. It's another topic for a talk, obviously. But Oregon had done it uh, because Oregon had it was already developing a tradition whereby, if they liked the candidate, they could have cared less about the party label. If it was a straight shooter who was talking about the issues voters were interested in. They were sincere and honest. They were going to get my vote. Penoyer did it twice. He was the only Democrat elected twice and, and served eight years as governor of the state until John Kitzhaber did, 100 years before another Democrat would be elected and serve two full terms, 100 years. And here comes George Chamberlain in 1892, elected governor of the state by 246 votes. Of one of the best leaders we've ever had. Nobody's ever heard of him. He was re-elected governor in 1906. And in 1909, the legislature chose him as the People's Choice candidate for Senate and put him in the U.S. Senate. 
and Chamberlain went off to two full terms in the U.S. Senate. So from 1902 to 1921, George Chamberlain was governor of Oregon or United States senator from Oregon. And no one's ever heard of the man. <coughs> now, Jim Harris, you're the only really super young guy in here. All of Chamberlain's papers are at the University of Oregon Library. And if I were 54 rather than 74, I would do, we'll start working on a biography of George Chamberlain because there's a big hole in Oregon's history there. George Chamberlain needs to have a book. At any rate, um, Mr. West, I'm off the path a little bit, but that happens. Mr. West had been brought into state govern government originally by George Chamberlain. Chamberlain had appointed West, who was a bank teller and active in the Democratic Party locally in Salem. He had put this squeaky clean, honest young man and another teetotaler like Chamberlain was, a staunch teetotaler was West, uh, had put him in as the state land agent. And when West becomes land agent with the backing of the governor, he starts a year-long secret, a very quiet study and investigation of all of the wrongdoing that had been taking place in Oregon for the last 25 years relating to the purchase of or the swapping of federal lands. There were huge land scams going on in this state. And Oz West report exposed all of this. It led to indictments, uh, 33 indictments, including some state legislators, a member of Congress, and Oregon's senior United States Senator John Hipple Mitchell, whose actual name was John Hiram Mitchell, he called himself, but of course the name Mitchell was a made up name because his name was John Hipple and he was on the run from Pennsylvania. He was our senator for 22 years. That's another wonderful talk. It's all in the book, by the way. Just juicy stuff, it's just great fun, but it's all part of how we got here. And we learn along the way from these experiences. We've learned that we'd rather have a squeaky clean government, that we have very strict laws about uh, uh, finance. We have, we're not as strict as we need, that's my opinion. But uh, the fact is that Oregon has uh, cleaned up its act early. It's one of the first states to do that with the initiative referendum and recall. We're the first state to have all three. And, we're the, and in 1910, well, I gotta keep going. I gotta stay with the, with the contest here. Mr. West went all over the state. He uh, attacked Bowerman for being obviously against the political reform sweeping Oregon. Baron, Bowerman himself was an imposing figure, a, a good deal larger than West was. West was about my size. Um, but Oswald, Oswald West had an intensity about him um, that, uh, that really appealed to people. Uh, it, this guy had strong beliefs and you knew he would follow up his conviction with his convictions. Oswald West won by pinning a number of things on Bowerman. One is that he's an old machine politician. He's a nominee by convention. He's an opponent of the initiative referendum and the recall. And he happens to be retained by the Union Pacific Railroad. He's a lawyer on retainer to the Union Pacific. Now the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific, Harriman's Railroad, was one of the most notorious sources of, of financial corruption. The money that flowed from the railroads, and this was true with banks as well, uh, into the political coffers of Oregon. So uh, West, in fact, I have a political cartoon here. I know I have to stay back here because I'm being filmed. Here's a, a, young, a photo of a young Oswald West, handsome guy. And here is a political cartoon uh, from the Medford Mail Tribune. The Mail Tribune did like West and they endorsed him. And they ran this cartoon on the front page, afraid of his record. Here is a cartoon, uh, Jay Bowerman down here, assembly candidate for governor, never took statement one, defeated the 14 hour railroad bill, was Harriman attorney while in the state Senate. Well, Bowerman was not only a railroad attorney for, for Harriman, but he was the president of the Senate. And, and you can go back and you'll see all of this in the book. 
gee, there's a strong relationship between whoever the Senate president of Oregon is and being a railroad attorney. It's right down the line. It's all there. It's in the book. It's people just they're they're I, I see you're sitting here incredulous, but I, I don't I understand why you're incredulous. That's why I had to write this book because I started finding this stuff out and and nobody had ever put it down, taken the time to do it. This is all part of where we came from. Oswald West won by 6,100 votes in a state that was three to one Republican. Bowerman never knew what hit him. 1960, excuse me, 1954, for jumping. The last Democrat elected governor in Oregon prior to 1954 was George Chamberlain, his second term in 1914. 40 years passed, 40 and no Democrat was elected a senator of Oregon. 40 years, all Republicans. This is still a rocked rib Republican state. In fact, Oregon's called the Vermont of the West. It is so reliably Republican. The war changed things drastically in more ways than we'll ever understand. There's a chapter about it in the book. People came here from other parts of the country in large numbers, particularly the South and the Midwest, because of the opportunities, particularly in the shipyards, shipbuilding industry, and other war-related industries in the Portland area. The war put or Portland on the map. It became one of the most, uh, one of the busiest ports in North America, Portland did, besides being a big shipbuilding center. So um, a lot of people who are here uh, are from very different part of the country, and, and many of them, particularly union-oriented people, and the unions, of course, really take off in Oregon in the w during the war period, um, uh, union people are going to tend to be Democrats. In 1950, for the first time since the 1870s, uh, the Democratic Party drew even with st in statewide registration with the Republican Party. The Republican Party had been the dominant party in state registration most of the time, three to one, for the better part of 100 years. Now, the party, the resurgence of the Democratic Party didn't happen by chance. The two men led it. Howard Morgan, who died two years ago, and Monroe Sweetland, uh, those two men uh, led the resurgence of the Democratic Party. Actually, not the resurgence. The Democratic Party was all but dead, actually. And they res resurrected it and built it into a viable political organization throughout the state of Oregon. Um, there were signs that things were changing in Oregon. In 1954, we have a titanic battle between uh, Guy Corden, who most people don't remember. Guy Corden, uh, who had been a lobbyist for uh, uh, timber interests and the Oregon and California uh, federal lands in the, uh, in the state of Oregon, been a lobbyist in D.C. for 10 years, a small town Roseburg lawyer. You can read about him in your handout. Uh, but Corden had been appointed uh, upon the death of uh, Charles McNary who had been our longtime senator since 1918. One of the most distinguished uh, politicians we've ever had was Charles McNary, who was a vice presidential candidate in 1940 with Wendell Wilkie against FDR, running third term. Charles McNary was a, a, a much esteemed, he was the minority leader of the Senate throughout the, much of the Depression and the war. Uh, a very fine man, uh, uh, um, a reliable, honest, hardworking, his, his word meant something, he had a progressive streak in him. He was a prototype of what we get with McCall, Hatfield, and uh, Mr. Packwood. He's a, a prototype of, of that modern progressive re Republican who was able to cross the aisle and pull Democratic votes. That's one reason why they were such a successive, successful politicians is because Democrats voted for them as well as Republicans right down the line. Um, and that's what's happened to the Democrat Republican Party in Oregon today is it's become so much co-opted by the conservative wing of the party that, and they can't figure out why they can't get a Republican elected governor because they cannot seem to find enough of a middle of the, of the road Republican. Uh, Mr. Saxton, who ran a few years ago, um, was, a, was, a, was a, as close as they've gotten. Um, the fact is, um, we've just seen the Dorchester conference end, and Republicans are very 
very intent upon changing that. And uh, I'm concerned because I'm getting a little off track, I know, off a message, but I'm concerned because I don't see young Democrats coming up or young Republicans coming up. Uh, the candidates tend to be older. They've been around, lots of them in state government for a while, but we're, we're not bringing up fresh talent. Mark Hatfield was 28 years old when he was elected to the legislature, 28. So was Richard Neuberger, 28, when he was elected to the legislature. Bob Packwood was 30 when he was elected to the legislature. Ron Wyden was 31 when he was elected to Congress at 31. Neil Goldschmidt was 28 when he was elected to the Portland City Council. Where are these people? Do you know, I, uh, maybe I'm not tuned in, but where in Salem are these young men and women 30-ish who are the future leaders of the state? I don't see them coming. Now, of course, we get, we get some, some rare exceptions. We've got uh, uh, Senator Merkley, who basically came out of the blue in his middle 30s, came to the legislature, ended up as speaker, and at 39, bang, goes off to the U.S. Senate. Who would have seen that coming? Well, let's get back to the topic at hand, which is Richard Neuberger and Guy Corden. Guy Corden was as conservative as Richard Neuberger was liberal. There has never been a starker contrast in candidates in the history of Oregon politics than there was between these two men. Guy Corden, small town lawyer, an effective senator behind the scenes, much respected behind the scenes. He was not a mover and shaker. He worked well one-on-one. -on -one. He worked great in groups, in committee. He had several important committees assignments in the Senate. Um, Guy Corden was not to be taken lightly, but he was not expressive. He did not toot his own horn. He did not like campaigning. He, in fact, walked into a room and said, I'm not a politician. Well, you've been in the Senate for 10 years. I think you're a politician. But he, he, would, he couldn't bring himself to even say it in public, that I'm a politician. At any rate, Guy Corden runs against Richard Neuberger. Richard Neuberger uh, is 41 years old. Guy Corden is 64, night and day in terms of age. And we see it again in 68, don't we, with Packwood and Morse, 68 and 36. We're talking generational differences here, stark contrasts. One seen as the past and one seen as the future. And Oregonians are much impressed by that. And, and we see it uh, with Ron Wyden uh, coming to Congress in, in the early 70s. We see it with Packwood coming out of basically out of nowhere. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Back to the 54 campaign. Richard Neuberger married smartly a Portland school teacher named Maureen Brown, who became Maureen Neuberger and became senator, of course, taking her husband's seat in 1960 upon his death. They were both in the legislature together, Dick in the Senate and Maureen in the House. They were the best known political couple in Oregon. Richard Neuberger, most of you know it's all in the biography, was a prolific writer. He was a renowned writer. Everybody who was in the world of journalism and writing in this country knew uh, who Richard Neuberger was. He was um, highly esteemed as an effective writer, particularly on issues which were coming to the fore in Oregon. He was kind of creating public opinion, Neuberger was, through his articles and his speeches. He was a charismatic, charismatic speaker. He's tall, he's 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 he's f very dynamic and he was spellbinding to listen to. Guy Corden is none of that. He didn't want to give talks. He, didn't, he was uncomfortable in front of groups, except maybe at the local Rotary down in Roseburg. He, those were his friends. He knew those people. He was comfortable there. Richard Neuberger and Guy Corden had a, a very political race. Now, by political, I mean because what Neuberger was able to do was to tie Corden into some of the most unpopular policies in the Eisenhower administration. Now remember who the Secretary of Interior was? Douglas McKay of Oregon under Eisenhower. Doug McKay, former governor. 
Now McKay and most of the Republicans in Oregon believed in hydroelectric power development. But where they differed from Democrats was that they believed that pri private utilities ought to develop public power, not public utilities. And Newberger, of course, put this label, he actually used it, a reporter had used it before him, but Newberger had put the label of Senator Giveaway on Corden. He and McKay were in cahoots to give away all the wonderful hydroelectric installations that had come onto the uh, Northwest and particularly along the Columbia, and they wanted to s somehow push that into the hands of private utilities, particularly PGE. Well, that was a convincing art uh, uh, argument, uh, one of the arguments w why Newberger won, uh, but Guy Corden uh, was his own worst enemy in the sense that he would not, he would not talk about himself. He, he uh, was emphatic about it. Uh, he was not a good interviewer, uh, interviewee. Um, Newberger and Maureen stumped the state. They worked very, very hard. Um, he, of course, Newberger knew much of the press of Oregon, the media, particularly the newsprint, uh, the newspapers. Um, and was always welcome. They may not have agreed with his politics because he was seen as so liberal. But he, this is the most liberal man who's ever run for politics in Oregon. This is a state that's elected Republicans for 40 straight years. And here comes a man who's not just a Democrat, but a liberal Democrat, 41 years old. He's, he represents the face of the future, you see, and Oregonians see that. Now, Corden's voting record was very conservative. He was against school lunch programs. He, didn't, he think, I th didn't think that was the responsibility of the federal government to feed hungry children at school. He, he, uh, he was a small government man. He thought the federal government part partly shouldn't be in NATO because he said, we can't afford that. We can't afford NATO. Boy, have we gone a long way since then, haven't we? Maybe Corden was a right. But the fact is that... Um, Corden was a, 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 an isolationist. He was a very much a man of, of the 20s and the 30s. His values were small town Oregon values. Oregon is growing, becoming, especially in the Portland area, urbanized, uh, a, a little more attuned to what's going on in the rest of the country and the world. And uh, Dick Newberg is right out in front. The election was so close that we did not know for three days who had won. Newberger was elected in 54 along with a woman named Edith Scarrett Green. Hmm. You see what's happening? The Democrats aren't just electing a senator, they're electing a woman to Congress in the form of Edith Green, who will have a 20 year career in the Senate and become one of the most powerful Oregonians ever to serve in Congress, Edith Green. Like Maureen Newberger, Brown, Brown Newberger, she had been a high school teacher, as had Betty Roberts, been a high school teacher. Aha, see, we need to be talking to the young teachers, I guess, here, huh? I'm, of course, a teacher, was a teacher. The point is that Newberger's election was extremely close, uh, but he did win, and uh, you know the story from there. Well, there's two stories of interest I'll give you. One sample is he, of course, had been backed ardently by his former mentor at the University of Oregon, Wayne Morse. Wayne Morse backed Newberger in 1954 over Mr. Corden. Morse, remember, had been elected twice as a Republican, had left the Republican Party in 1952 to become an independent, became a Democrat in 1955 and ran in 1956 and won as a Democrat in 56 and was reelected in 62 as a Democrat. But he backed Newberger, okay? He gave 100 speeches for Newberger in Oregon. Senator Wayne Morse gave 100 speeches for Newberger. Morse was a big draw. He always had salty things to say. He told it like he saw it. And people, he, 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 Newberger, you cannot uh, uh, overestimate the influence that Newberger that Wayne Morris had in Dick Newberger's successful campaign. People liked Maureen. She was m much more reticent than Newberger, Dick Newberger was. 
but she was used to uh, commanding in her own presence, work, good working a room of women, which was an uh, important thing too, because remember, women are voting in 1954, unlike 1910. At any rate, Richard Newberger is elected senator. There's a huge dispute between he and a uh, terrible falling out between he and Wayne Morse. Uh, they end up vicious enemies. It's a terrible, terrible story. And um, Dick Newberger is diagnosed with brain cancer. And he dies in 1960 at the age of 47, 47 years old. Now you can imagine what his career would have been if he had not died prematurely. There's no question that Dick Newberger would have probably been in the Senate as long as he wanted to be, certainly as long as 30 years out, like Mark Hatfield. But we'll never know. It's interesting, Guy Corden also died of a brain tumor, as did Charles McNary. <coughs> Charles McNary was replaced by Mr. Corden, <coughs> who was replaced by Mr. Newberger, all of whom died of brain tumors. Now, this is oddball stuff, let's face it. I think I'm the first person who's ever put that together. I've never heard that anybody say that, but that's true. Just, I mean, political junkies love this stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is just, this is like baseball statistics, you know. All right, the last election, the last uh, campaign is 1968. We know the story. Those of you who were in the room who were here at the time probably remember a lot about this. I certainly do. I just moved back to Oregon from California where my wife and I had lived for five years coming back to uh, teach it in the Beaverton School District. Uh, model uh, convention was being held that year. Uh, as you know, uh, Loa High School did this for many years. S it started at Sensei, the, the student mo model mock conventions involving 3,000 students from the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, fabulous experience for kids. At any rate, um, Richard Newberger, excuse me, um, Mr. Morse, didn't see it coming. Bob Packwood had been getting ready for several years. He had been building a, an organization statewide. He had been collecting money. And he came into 1968 of a firm belief that, that not only did he have a good chance against Mr. Morris, but if he played his cards right, he would defeat him soundly. He didn't defeat him soundly. He only defeated him by about 3,200 votes. But Bob Packwood defeated one of the most powerful men in the United States Senate, Wayne Lyman Morse, in 1968. Um, going to uh, my book again, I'm sorry to keep getting off track here. Wayne Morris and his staff were slow to realize that Bob Packwood was a serious threat. Not until late September did Morse begin to focus 100% on his campaign. Late September. Packwood had the advantage of his youth and financial backing. Money came from across the country from donors concerned about Morse's position on the Vietnam War and energized by the possibility of adding a new Republican to the Senate. Packwood's strongest advantage may have been the years he had spent organizing the moderate wing of the Republican Party. Relying heavily on residential lawn signs and radio and TV ads, Packwood concentrated on making his name known to voters all over Oregon. Packwood, like Bob Duncan in the May Democratic primary, criticized Morse for being out of touch with Oregonians, for being too old, and for being too much of a one-man band. It was time for a change. Oregon needed new leadership, said Packwood. Morse countered by stressing his seniority in the Senate and how he used his power to help Oregon. But many Oregonians weren't listening. Now please recall that in the spring of 1968, Congressman Robert Duncan had challenged Wayne Morse in the Democratic primary. It was a bloody, bruising brawl. Morse spent well over a quarter of a million dollars and exhausted himself fighting back Mr. Duncan, and he beat him by only 10,000 votes. So the Democratic Party had been ripped uh, in half by this Senate race. And that's another factor in 
Morse's defeat. There were, uh, Morse, of course, was an a, a, a outspoken opponent of the war. Mr. Duncan was a hawk, a strong supporter of Lyndon Johnson and America's policy in Vietnam. So you had those two positions. But Morse, who was a, 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 a remarkably resilient campaigner, never stopped, and of course loved getting in front of groups like this and talking for an hour, two, or three. Um, Wayne Morse was, um, he wasn't ready for what Packwood brought to the table. Bob Packwood was of the new school of politics. He was into technology. He was into organization. He challenged McCall to a TV debate. On October 25th, 1968, the two men faced each other in downtown Portland in a statewide televised debate. Morse is silver-haired with his bushy silver eyebrows, and he wears a gray suit. Packwood's 36. No wrinkles in his face, his hair is the color he was born with. Packwood was prepared like you can't believe. 90 second sound bites. It was, a, a Morse had agreed to a two minute time limit on the responses. He couldn't talk about anything in two minutes and his, if it saved, he couldn't do it. And of course what happened is that Morse appeared to be either ev ev evading the answer or he didn't know what he was talking about. As he, as the, the hour goes on and on and on, Packwood zing, 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 zing. And he knew Morse's voting record. Morse would say something and come right back at him and say, well, what about this, Senator? What about this? What about this? And Morse was spinning his wheels. He looked ill-prepared. He looked exhausted, which of course he was. He'd just been through that grueling primary gone back to D.C., taken up his position. He was a head of a couple of important committees. Um, Wayne Morse liked to practice being a senator. He says, I can do more for Oregonians by staying back here and working in the, in the Capitol than I can coming home and talking to you all. Well, that cost him because back Bob Packwood, of course, was here working full time. And Wayne Morse was caught napping on election night was defeated by 3,200 votes. We know the story. He'll come back at Packwood um, four years, six years later. Uh, we'll be in the Oregon primary, Democratic primary. We'll win the Democratic nomination at the age of 74 and dies in July, which, of course, created all kinds of chaos. For the Democrats, they had to bring somebody in to fill Morse's position that was Betty Roberts. And she got killed by Packwood. Um, halfway through the campaign, there's a new Democrat running. So it, the story doesn't, doesn't turn out well there, but Wayne Morse never did get back to the United States Senate. But here we have the old versus the new, as we had in 54 with Corden and Newberger. We'll never know what Newberger's days might have been if he had remained alive, but he certainly, because of his young age at 47, Mark Hatfield went to the Senate when he was 46. Bob Packwood went to the Senate when he was 36, you see. And um, okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? There's so much more I could tell you <laughs> about Oz West, fascinating man. Somebody put a little biography out on him last year, and it was, it's, uh, don't waste your time. Uh, John Tyner, forum member. Uh, Representative Marsh, here. John yes. Tyner. <laughs> yeah, um, Mr. Tyner, hi. How you doing? Good. Um, one of the little known um, parts of Oregon history is how corrupt it was through a lot of its history, but one of the first cases that a law student learns is, is a case called Panoya versus Neff um, in civil procedure. I heard the lawyers kind of cackle out here. It involved the, the, the essentially the criminal who was our state senator, John Mitchell, for a period of time. Since you touched on Mitchell, uh, do you have more to offer on, on Mr. Mitchell's hijinks in the state of Oregon? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> the question's about John Mitchell, uh, which is, of course, his assumed name. Uh, I don't have time, and, uh, and it, the question doesn't uh, require me to do it, but uh, 
if I told you what this man's personal life and background was, you, you would not believe it. It is just beyond melodrama. Dr melodrama. At any rate, John Mitchell was four times chosen United States Senator by the Oregon legislature in four of the most corrupt political campaigns in Oregon history. John Mitchell, once he got into the Senate, had a hard time giving it up. He really loved the position. Mitchell, I, ha oh, I don't have a picture of him. Um, Mitchell had a, a, a long clipped Van Dyke kind of beard, uh, always dressed impeccably, little stick pin, hair always, uh, silver hair. He looked like a senator, uh, but he was corrupt. Um, what happened was, um, according to the report that Oswald West had done and had, had ended up as federal indictment, uh, John Mitchell, sitting Senator Mitchell, 22 years our senator, was indicted for accepting a bribe, a bribe to intervene on behalf of a constituent relating to a land transfer in D.C. Um, um, the, the charge was that he had accepted two $1,000 bills to help grease this land trans transaction. And he was found guilty. He was held on trial, put on trial in Portland in July of 1905. And sitting Senator John Mitchell, who everybody adored, they just thought he was the most wonderful senator, um, very little legislation uh, in his 22 years to, I mean, nothing d distinctive about his Senate career. Um, but he was a reliable Republican vote in the Senate. Um, and, uh, but people didn't know this seamy side of his life. We do not know how many other bribes, if any, John Mitchell ever took. But we can assume uh, at the age of 70, 72, he's taking $2,000 bribe. He's found guilty of that. He's sentenced to six months in jail, and it's in the book, and a, a, a fine. Uh, he, of course, appealed, and uh, in December, of 1905, he was in the dentist chair. He, uh, he, uh, Mitchell was a diabetic, and he died. He died in the dentist chair in December 1905. Um, something to do with laughing gas or diabetic something, but it killed him. He never did go to jail, um, and that was the end of John Mitchell. Um, interesting story. Somebody ought to do a book. <laughs> I have a chapter on him, by the way. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks for coming in and talking today. You're welcome. <coughs> I just wanted to, I wanted to say that uh, Representative Ben Younger is a young guy uh, from Washington County. Um, Tobias Reed is pretty young. He was very young when he ran. Uh, Suzanne Bonamici was quite young right. when she got involved. Right. Our Secretary of State, our Finance, our, our uh, Treasurer, our Labor Commissioner were all really young. But you're right, I don't see any really young people starting out right now. My question, my question centers on what you talked about. Uh, you said that the Republicans uh, were having trouble because of their, cons their agenda was too conservative. And I was just kind of wondering if you had any thoughts or ideas about what they might do or what they might be planning on doing to try to get change that. Well, that's a really good question. Um, that's, um, Oregon, you know, every, every state has its own makeup, its traditions, its patterns, its values, its history. Um, Oregon, like most places, continues to change. I mean, the, the coming of, of, of technology to this county, as you well know, has, ch has absolutely transformed this state. There's no question that Oregon is very different than it was 35 years ago because of, of Intel in particular and the sp all of the spinoffs. Um, it's hard to say because what, what uh, to answer that question, part of the problem is that Oregon is not like any other place. What happened to the fellow that asked me the question? Oh, he's back over here. Um, Oregon is not like any other place. Um, Oregon is, as we know, a blue state. Uh, we're he we're uh, heavily Democratic in terms of registration, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a Republican can't get elected here. Um, we just had uh, uh, um, the senator uh, who is defeated by um, Gordon Smith. Gordon Smith is a good example of a middle to conservative Republican who runs statewide and wins twice in a Democratic state. So um, part of it, I think, with Smith was uh, personality and looks uh, and uh, issues. He tended to be 
as much middle of the road as most of the Republicans who've been nominees for high office in this state have been. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it depends on the candidate. Um, if the best you can do is, is, to, uh, is to nominate a washed up NBA center as your state candidate, uh, then you're probably not going to have a very good chance of getting, getting uh, that person elected. Um, but look, go back and look at the formulas. Look at the, look at the Republicans who've been very successful in this state. The Wendell Wyatt from this area and, 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 and Hatfield and, and Packwood and McCall and Clay Myers, Secretary of State. Uh, um, and we could go on. Um, so it's partly, uh, partly personality. The time and the circumstances has something to do with it. Who's the Democratic candidate? Obviously, voters who have a choice between one or the other. Maybe there's something about the Democratic candidates that make majority people more find more appealing than the Republican candidate. I think a lot of the Republican problem is that they've got baggage. They've got a lot of baggage they're carrying around, uh, particularly a lot of their extreme social positions. Um, and, and, and you can see this in the polls, the polls showing that um, you know, whatever the poll is, a majority of Americans in the poll think that um, the Republicans are too much this way or too much this way or too much this way. More of it, more of a, uh, see them as, as extremists when it comes to social issues. That's one reason why it was interesting to see what they did at Dorchester this weekend with their, with their vote on the resolution on gay marriage. Maybe they're learning. Times are changing and they need to change with the times because they, as you know, voted by a fairly healthy margin to support gay marriage and to vote for, and to push for the repeal of the constitutional amendment we put in our constitution in this state. So, you know, that's, I see that as a sign of moving toward the middle. Now, of course, it's just a convention. It's not binding on anybody, but it seems to me that the kinds of things that the Republican Party has to do, and of course, then they have to find the commiserate candidates so who will appeal to people. Harry Bodine, for a member. Oh, Harry Bodine, <coughs> for heaven's sake! I Tom, I just uh, I remember I remember the day I remember the day that you came to by my front yard and gave me this Democratic propaganda when I was mowing the lawn. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> I actually remember that too because I was surprised to see you because I knew you from the Aragon. Anyway, before. just the uh, Harry Bodine. I still live in House District 34, and you know we have an interesting situation. Next week we're hearing from two candidates, Democratic side, running for this position. There is no Republican candidate, at least as of Saturday night, about 9 o'clock, when I had a, my personal visit with the, the uh, minority leader of the Oregon House down at Dorchester. It was the first time I'd been in 40 years. It was fun. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, my point is this. District 34 is, has been gerrymandered to the point where no Republican can win it. That's, that's the consensus. So the 50 whatever, 52, 55 percent of the people of the district who are not Democrats basically are, they might as well stay home from this election. They, they, they will have no say at all, you know, because it's, the primary will decide it. And we have more and more districts. I think there, what about, we may have eight or nine competitive districts. But I'm, I, I hear your concern about where are the young people coming up, you know. And um, the Packwood's message Saturday was, he, he went around and recruited candidates. The whole purpose of Dorchester was to discover candidates who could, who could get elected. Anyway, just I, is this a question? Could you comment on it? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if that's a question, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, Bob Papkut, I believe, is the one who was, who was the inspiration for the Dorchester Conference in the first place 50 years ago. Um, uh, as savvy a politician as this state's ever produced, Bob Packwood. He's a politician inside out, and he needs to have a biography too. Somebody needs to write the book on, on Bob Packwood uh, because he certainly has changed Oregon politics uh, in many ways. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think you're right about identifying people to run for office. Nobody came up to me and said, have you thought about running for office? No, I just came out of the woodwork. I'd been a precinct committeeman, but that was all. There was. No, no draft, no big committee that came in, uh, no individual says, I think you should run. You, you have to find those people and, and put the bee in their bonnet. 
And of course, a good place to do that is at a convention, at a Republican or Democratic or Independent Party or Green Party or whatever the party is. Um, people have to be able to see themselves as a politician. Uh, a, most of us don't see ourselves as politicians, even though we are all the time. All, we are political animals. By nature, we're political. Um, I don't know uh, if that's, that, that uh, doesn't answer your question, but I'm not sure there's a question there. <laughs> Is, uh, 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 what is House District 34 now? That's the old District 5 that I represented. <laughs> yeah, well, a little piece of mine went up to the West Hills, I know that, and way out here to Aloha. Um, we have the same issue. It's even more of a problem in the Congress. Uh, the House districts in Congress are so gerrymandered that, yeah, it's, it's Im almost impossible to get anybody of the opposite party to even have a chance in most congressional districts. And that we've allowed that to happen. It happens through our states. Of course, our states set the political boundaries. Courts, when the state legislatures can't figure it out, but it's a come a, become a political football, and it depends on which party controls the legislature at the time, it's t every 10 years at the federal census, to, to redraw the congressional boundaries. State legislatures do that. That's where the problem is, if there is a problem, that the districts aren't fair as they stand, they're, they're weighted to one party or the other. And redistricting doesn't have to take place just every 10 years. My name is Lee Coleman, I'm a forum member. Looking to the future, uh, your political wisdom, uh, is there any way to separate the Tea Party, Know Nothing Party from the Republican Party in the primary system? The Republicans do have a problem it's having to face the Taliban during <laughs> their own primary. Got any ideas? Well, of course, uh, the Republicans have got to figure this out for themselves. Uh, nobody's going to do it for them. For them. Um, uh, one thing Republicans can, can do is do not vote for the Tea Party candidates. Well, we're uh, the the, the tea, tea Party, tea, it's separating the two. Well, what about the Whigs? Oh, <laughs> well, I don't, th I don't think the Republican Party cut in half or splintered is going to have any, a lot of luck, just like the Democratic Party would. And we've tried this before. In 1948, we had four parties had candidates for president. That uh, helped Mr. Truman a lot. Chris Leslie, four member. Would uh, term limits possibly bring more young people into the congressional races since we have these guys lasting 30 years sure. as congressmen? Well, we had uh, term limits in Oregon, remember, that was uh, passed by the voters. We had term limits here for a number of years. Well, not a terrible lot of, about 20 years maybe, uh, if that. And that, it was thrown out by the courts. So we have tried that experiment here. Um, but of course, we, we, can, we, we voters have the power to have term limits anytime we want to. We control the votes. Um, we can vote a person out of office anytime we want, if we get together to do it. I really want to thank you for being here. It's been really, really enlightening and, and interesting. So thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, John. That, that's uh, the so John McQuaid. Cut it, is no, it? Four members. No, actually, uh, actually, I had, I had to have a question. Because you talked a little bit earlier about um, candidates running uh, and their chances, whether Democrats or Republicans. But um, the Supreme Court just did something that makes it a little bit different, and that's the fact that money is no issue anymore. Yeah. And so, could you speak a little bit about Citizens United? Thank you. Citizens United, I can't talk about them so much as, uh, you know, we all have opinions about the court's decision. And I don't know how long it'll take for either the Congress or the court to act to, ch to reverse this or to change this, but we all know that Pandora's box has been opened, and this is a horrible mess of snakes. And, um, Anybody who follows politics at all knows it's all about power and the pursuit of power. That's what politics is. 
And when you don't have any limits on the kind of money that can flow or even any control over who it is who's doing something on your behalf in your name, um, then, then it's wide open. Any, anything can happen. And that's one reason the Tea Party's been so successful because besides attracting a few billionaires to their cause, um, they, um, they've got money uh, coming from, lots of money coming from very conservative channels, which is fine, that's the way the system works, but the question is should there be limits on what, what those groups or organizations. See, lots of candidates run for office and don't even have any idea who's putting up money on their behalf in terms of um, what the ads are being run or the, um, what's coming over the internet or whatever. Um, Repu the, uh, Republicans and Democrats both have, have lost control of, of the whole thing. It's a mess. <laughs> Hi. Whoa. My book is here. <laughs> One more question. Hello. Oh, yes. Hi, Tom. I'm Emily Knapp, for a member. I Emily Knapp, I know you too from yes. 2,000 years ago. Yes. And I worked for Maureen Neuberger one summer in the Senate as an intern and loved her to pieces. Does your book have anything about Maureen's taking over for her husband? Yes, a little bit, not much, not about her term per se. She married a, a, a New York doctor, as you know, and, 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 and retired, yeah. She, um, she didn't love politics as much as Dick did. He loved it. He would have stayed in the Senate the forever if he, if he could have, yeah. All righty. Well, the book is here. Uh, I will sign your book if you should like to purchase one. Uh, excuse me? Twenty nine ninety five. We can take cash or a check. We, um, we've had people buy as many as six books, uh, give one to each of their kids. Uh, seriously, four books, give one to each of their kids. Yeah, very popular at Christmas time. <laughs> By the way, I have uh, some photographs that I didn't get to show you. Uh, being behind this lectern with this camera and all these lights on is not something I traditionally do. I appreciate the opportunity for this exposure, but it keeps me from moving in the room, and that's what I typically do. I'm usually up and down the room, and I can get real close to you. Picture of uh, Richard Newberger. for those of you who don't remember what he looked like, bald as a apple. He, he certainly looked older than he was. Here's Guy Corden, a jaunty picture of Senator Corden in 1944, taken just before he was appointed to the Senate by Governor Snell. He always had a pipe in his mouth. He's virtually every fo photograph you see of Corden or every caricature cartoon done of Corden, there's a pipe in his mouth. Mr. Packwood's photo that he supplied me personally is the one that's in the book. My book, uh, my book has biographies in them, one to two page biographies of about 20 leading politicians. So if you want to find out something about, I mean, you talk to a young person today about Tom McCall, they say, who? And if you're under, four, if you're under 40, 45 in this day, you don't know who Tom McCall is. You, you weren't alive, you don't know anything about him. Um, here's Wayne Morris, of course. A politician's politician, if there ever was one. And an awfully good senator in terms of working, working hard for Oregon. All righty. Thank you for coming. We'll be signing books and selling books right over here. Folks, step on up, get your book. We'll convene here again in a week where we'll kick off election season. Thanks for being here. Have a good week.